recording everything, all of our audio and everything you see on my screen. And I will send you a link that lets you see this recording in a YouTube file, um, you know, where you can fast forward if you want, pause, rewind, stuff like that. Okay. Now, the way I usually work is I ask the students to bring the problems to the session because okay. clearly not being in your class, I don't know what, what type of stuff you've been going over. So uh, do you have some problems for today that you can verbalize? I have, um, he gave, we have a test next Tuesday. Okay. And he gave us a study guide. All right. Um, algebra 2, if it's Algebra 2 stuff, it's usually you can verbalize Algebra 2 pretty good. Geometry would be a little harder. With, with geometry students, they kind of almost need to take a picture of the material and send it to my email, and then I bring it up on my screen. Right. So if you have even some algebra problems may be dependent on you reading a graph or something. Um, um, no, most of them are pretty easy to vocalize. Okay. Like, okay, so one of them is y to the one-third power times the quantity y to the two-thirds power plus y to the five-thirds power. Like that? Um, y to the two-thirds plus y to the five-thirds is in one, yeah. Like that. So, what are, what's the first thing we're going to do here? Uh, distribute the y on the outside. Okay. So, what is uh, that times that? Uh, y to the three-thirds? Or is it just y? Just y. And y to the one. You were right. Three-thirds. In other words, we're going to add the exponents. And I, I don't y need... I don't need the one, and I'll get rid of it just because it has other meanings when you get into calculus and stuff like that. Okay. So then plus y to the six-thirds. Or y squared. Right. Okay. So that's what that simplifies to. And then we cannot simplify that any further. We cannot add y's to y squareds. Okay. Yeah, okay. because they're not... Uh, they're not the same thing. Just like I couldn't add those two things together first. Right. Okay. You okay. can only add like things. In other words, if, if I have a 3y squared and I want to add a 4y squared, well, I can add those two things. They're both y squareds. So that would right. give me 7y squared. Okay. But make one of them a cube, and now i got apples and oranges. And right. I cannot add apples to oranges. Multiplying is a different thing. You can multiply stuff much easier than adding it. And that's actually true in all of algebra. If you go back and think about fractions, it's much easier to multiply fractions than it is add them. You know, if I give you this and I say add that, you have to find a common denominator. It's a hard problem. But right. if you say multiply them, it's really easy. And that tends to be the case with variables to fractional exponents also. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, sh should I give you another problem? Sure. Okay. So this one's a little bit more complicated. Y plus 1 over C minus 1. I'm sorry. 1 plus 1 C minus over C minus 1. I'm sorry. There's no Y. 1 over C minus 1? It's 1 plus 1 over C minus 1. Okay. 1 plus 1 over C minus 1. Okay. All of that over 1 minus 1 over C minus 1. Okay. What's our first job here? Um, first thing we need to do. I don't know. <laughs> need to combine those. That and that by finding a least common denominator. Okay. okay. 
So let's take them one at a time. I'm going to do the numerator first. So what is the, numerator would what be is the least common denominator going to be? C minus 1. Correct. So what goes here? C minus 1. Okay. Plus 1 over C minus 1. Now, if we simplify that, we get C over C minus 1, right? Right. Now let's do the denominator. Same thing, only it's C minus 1 minus 1, right? So it's going to be C minus 2 over C minus 1. Okay, now we have a fraction divided by another fraction. What's the best way to do division? Um, take the take the reciprocal of the denominator. Right. See, and we can now do that. We could not do that when it was in that format there because we had right. a binomial term. But now that we have it as a rational fraction, rational quotient, we can flip and multiply. So and this, if you, you can cancel the C minus 1s. Yeah, you can. And it's tempting to always want to cancel them before flipping and multiplying. Uh, the problem is that, uh, so this ends up being C over C minus 2, which means, yeah, I could have just solved this straight by canceling the C minus 1s, and I've got C over C minus 2. And yes, you can do that as long as it's the denominator that's the same. If it's right. the numerator that's the same, you can't do that. And sometimes it's hard to remember which it is. And so the safest way to always do it is to flip the denominator, multiply, and see what you get. Okay. And then uh, uh, simplify. Now, this is an interesting problem. We have C over C minus 2. Can I simplify that? No. Correct. What if I had C minus 2 over C? Could I simplify that? No. Well, I can at least oh, you can divide two fractions. Right. In other words, that would be C over C, which is 1, minus 2 over C. Whether that's a simplification or not, I don't know, but at least I can do it. Right. Whereas here, I cannot do that. If the denominator is a binomial term, you cannot split it into two fractions. You can just cannot do that. Okay. okay, so there's basically no simplification I can make of that term, even if I wanted to. Okay. Um, so these are all like the problems we did at the beginning of the year, and I really just need to brush up on them because I haven't done them in a while. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so this is the quantity square root of 11 plus 4. Four outside uh, of the square root sign? Huh? The four outside of the radical sign? Yes. Okay. Times the quantity uh, square root of 11 minus 4. Okay. We're going to foil these. Is that what you've learned is something called foil? I Yeah, I know foiling. Is that what we okay. would do here? Yeah. In other words, okay. whenever you take a binomial times a binomial, they call it foil. I don't really like the word because it's first, outside, inside, last. Yeah. Works fine as long as you have a binomial term times a binomial term. But when you get a binomial times a trinomial, well, foil doesn't work. It doesn't, but you, I mean, it depends on how much common sense you have. Well, what I like to call it, rather than FOIL, is E-T-E-T, -E -T, which means every term by every term. Yeah. And that covers binomial times binomial. It covers trinomial times four terms. 
basically you want to make sure you just multiply every term by every term. So right. I do it methodically. I multiply that by that, and then I multiply that by that, and then I multiply that by that, and then I multiply that by that. And I add right. them all together. So what so is the that? First, Go ahead. The first term is going to be ele uh, square root of 11 squared, so just 11. Correct. Um, times, and then uh, 4 times square root of 11. We do need the minus sign. In other words, we're adding or subtracting each of these multiplications. Right. Okay. So, so minus 4 times the square root of 11. Four root 11. That's this one. Um, that one is what? Pl uh, plus 4 times the square root of 11. Okay. And then finally? And then uh, finally negative 16. Right. Notice these two terms disappeared. Right. So you have 11 minus 16. Right. So there's our answer. Now, let's take a little closer look at that. That's the difference of perfect squares factored. Oh. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, it is. Remember when you had a squared minus b squared, it always factored into a minus b times a plus b. Right. And they taught it to you as the difference of perfect squares. Well, it turns out that they don't have to be perfect squares. It's really just the difference of squares. So I could have something like x minus 7, and that's going to factor into square root of x minus square root of 7 times square root of x minus plus square root of 7. Okay? okay. So what... I'd like you to recognize is that whenever you see it in factored form, that it's easier to put it back together again than actually foiling it. Right. If you recognize that you're looking at A minus B times A plus B, you don't have to do all four steps of foiling. Yeah, that's true. All you need to do is get it back to that squared minus that squared. Right which is what we did. We had 11 minus 16. In other words, we could have written that as the first step if right. we recognize difference of squares. Okay. okay. Um, most, most math is good to be able to go both ways. In, in other right. words, another example of that would, would be, this is another good one to really know when you're Squaring a binomial, it's always a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And if you're squaring the subtraction of a binomial, it's always a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So that makes it fast to square things like uh, 2x plus 3y. If I wanted to square that, I'm not going to foil it. I'm going to use this. So that's 4x squared plus 2 times this times that, which is 12xy plus this squared, which is 9y squared. So I can get the answer much faster this way than I would have been able to by actually foiling it, or E-T-E-T, -E -T, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the only reason I point this out is that it's worth recognizing this in reverse also. Right. I saw a problem once. It makes life easier. One of the clever problems I've ever seen is this one right here. What's the answer to that? Um, uh, and you'll notice that would be hard to do even on a calculator. I could give you a calculator, and I'll, I'll bet you can come up with the answer quicker based on this than you would be able to with a calculator. The answer to it is, prob is uh, going to be 100 plus... 
99. The minus. Oh, minus 99. So one squared is one. Exactly. See, but if you didn't know these two formulas, you might not recognize that. Right. So it's really helpful when you learn these formulas like this uh, to know them in both directions. Okay. Okay, because you might see a test question similar to what I just wrote out, and that would be a hard thing to answer if you didn't know this stuff. Okay, so what else you got? let's do one more like this, and then I'll move on to the other stuff. Okay. This one is the quantity x minus y to the negative first to the negative first power over x to the negative first power minus y to the negative first power. Okay. What does this mean, x to the minus 1? It means x to the minus 1 means... Um, Just means the reciprocal. Right. So it, in this case, it means x on the... Well, one. and if I made it x to the minus 2, that would be 1 over x squared. So right. the negative exponent has nothing to do with negative numbers, first of all. And a, a lot of a lot of students, that's the first mistake they make, is they think it means a negative number. Okay? It does not. So, I can basically move that to the denominator. That whole... That whole thing. In other words, okay. I could write this as 1 over x minus y. So, let's do that. Okay, that's my new numerator. Okay. And then let's rewrite the denominator. X minus Y. Rewrite the denominator, so X minus Y over 1. 1 over X, that's what this thing is. Oh, sorry. Opposite. Minus 1 over Y. Okay. Over X minus so now what we've done is we've eliminated all these negative exponents. And now right. we can just solve it like a straight algebra problem. So you can combine those two terms, can't you? You can make it 1 over x minus y? Not quite. We have to subtract this from this, which means we have to find the common denominator. Okay. Now what's the, let me rewrite it over here. This is the numerator. And then, what's the common denominator going to be? X, Y. What goes here? Uh, y. And over here? X. Okay. And now we can rewrite that as Y minus X over X, Y. And now we can do our flip and multiply. Okay, so what we get is 1 over x minus y times xy over x minus y. Right. Now over y minus x. Oh, y minus x. Mm -hmm. Um. And this becomes uh, xy over yx minus yx. So over zero. Well, let's see. What does this become? We have xy minus x squared minus y squared plus xy. So we have 2xy's minus x squared minus y squared. Okay. Did I do that right, my math? 
xy minus x squared minus y squared minus plus xy. Yeah, I think I did it correct. Now, okay. can we simplify that at all? Yes. Maybe? No. Wait. <laughs> um, can I factor anything out? Yeah, you can factor one xy from the denominator out. Actually, actually not. Can you factor out no, xy from the denominator? I can't, I can't do anything here. In other words, if I look at just the denominator, I cannot pull out a greatest common factor. I can't pull out x. I can't pull out y. Right. I thought I could at first, but there's three terms. There's that term, there's that term, and there's that term, and there is no greatest common factor there. We okay. had it factored. It was factored that times that, okay? And if I leave it factored, it's actually, as a math person, I would prefer to see a factored answer rather than a multiplied answer. I like this answer better than I like this answer. Okay. Why? Because we have to take that answer and wonder whether I can factor this and pull out something that I might be able to cancel with something in the numerator. Right. Whereas if I already have it factored in the bottom circled case, then I can see that I can't cancel anything. I don't, I don't have any isolated XYs down here. Okay. That's the only thing I'd be able to cancel. In other words, if I had an X over there, then I could cancel out the X's. Or if I had a Y over there, I could do it. But whenever you have addition or subtraction going on, that destroys your ability to cancel stuff. In other words, I cannot cancel anything. If I have X over X plus 1, that's it. That's as simplified as it gets. Okay. I cannot definitely can't do that because this isn't x this is x plus one right it's a, it's one term as it like as it is well when you add numbers to a variable it changes it considerably such that you can only cancel stuff when it's being multiplied in other words if right. i had like i said if i had x y over x times y squared minus three well, now I could cancel the X's out because I got multiplication going on in the bottom and the top. Because canceling is just division. Exactly. What I'm doing is dividing the top by X and dividing the bottom by X. When I say cancel, you, you actually put it better. It's dividing top and bottom by the same quantity. Right. Okay. So the next thing is domain. Okay. So, like, the question, uh, square root of 2 minus x, the domain of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. The domain refers to the horizontal axis, or in this case, the x-axis. Okay. And it's all of the allowable values. Well... The best way to think about domain is to try to figure out what x cannot be. In other words, if, let, let's start with a simpler one. If I have this, what can x not be? Zero. That's it. It can be negative infinity. It can be positive infinity. The only thing it cannot be is zero. So the domain would be x is a member of all reals not equal to zero. Okay? okay? So now let's take your problem. What can x be? x can be anything that's not two. Can or it? negative or less than two. It can't be less than two. can't be greater than 2. In other words, x has to be less than or equal to 2. Okay, let me show you how to figure that out. In other words, we know that we can only take the square root of positive numbers, right? So basically, when I see a problem like this, I'm going to take whatever's inside the radical, no matter how complicated it is, and say that it has to be greater than or equal to 0. 
And then I just solve that. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Solve, so, solving X. this inequality, I'm going to move the 2 to the other side. Now I'm going to divide both sides by negative 1. And in the process of dividing by a negative number, I need to switch the inequality sign. And I come up with my answer. And you can see that why that works. In other words, if x was greater than 2, say it was 3, well, then we're taking the square root of a negative number. You can't do that for domain purposes. Okay. But if x were minus 100, that's fine. 2 minus minus 100 is plus 102. So okay. x can be as negative as you want. It just cannot be greater than 2. The moment it gets greater than 2, then what's inside the radical gets negative. Right. So it has to be less than or equal to... It cannot be less than or equal to 2. It has to be less than or equal to 2. Oh, know, it has to. Okay. This is the answer. Can you answer. take the square root of 0? Yes, you can. In other words, okay. 0 is in the domain. So it is. It's different than... Have you had logs yet? Uh briefly but if I gave you this equation the domain of X is actually has to be greater than zero you cannot take the log of zero you can take the square root of zero but you can't take the log of zero you okay. have to take the log of only numbers greater than zero I can take the log of point zero 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 one but I can't take the log of 0, I can't take the log of minus 1. So okay. this, a log equation, is a more restrictive domain than a square root domain. Okay. So when you write the domain answer, you would say... Well, it, it kind of depends. I mean, how your teacher wants you to write the domain. Uh, there's lots of ways. Are you familiar with interval notation? Uh, interval notation being with the, the parentheses? Yeah. That, for that last problem, this is what interval notation would have been. Okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, in other words, uh, x yeah, could he, be he anything that negative infinity to 2. He also accepts all real numbers not including... Yeah, that's other notation. Uh, X so is the number write... of all reals uh, such that X, um, well, you don't really use this one when the domain is so restrictive. In other words, right. on the problem we had, we had a really restricted domain. Uh, it was 2 minus X, yeah. Um, Usually you use this notation when x can be pretty much anything except for maybe one number. Okay. You know, if I said y equals x, well, now there's no restrictions at all, and this would be my answer. x is the set of all real numbers, and that's the domain. But if the domain is very restrictive, uh, you can use interval notation, or if it's only restricted to one number, then you could say X is all reals except blank. Right. So let's say it was Y is equal to the square root of X. It would be all real numbers except zero, right? No, because you can't have I mean, X oh, just, minus... It would be all real numbers less... All real numbers greater than zero. Yes. Greater than or equal to. You could say it that way. I would prefer to say it either this way, x has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's one way to say it, the domain. Okay. Another way to say it would be interval notation, zero to infinity. Saying it once again like this is... There's too many reals that it can't be. It, half right. the number line, it can't be. So I, I don't know that I like that kind of notation when half the numbers is all that it can be. Right. 
Okay, that makes sense. Actually, I wrote this wrong, the second one. That's a bracket. In other words, if it can be that number, it's always a bracket. If it can't be that number, it's a parentheses. And infinities always have parentheses around them. Right, because they go on forever. Well, because it's not a number. In other words, when you put a bracket around something, it says it can be whatever that number is. And infinity is not a number. It's a, it's a concept. It means growth without bound. Right. Okay. Okay, so what if the so domain for 3 over square root of x? Okay. So, so now, immediately it has to be greater than 0. Right. Now, can this one be 0? This uh, one can't be 0. This one cannot be 0 because then I would be because dividing by 0. So, so actually, that's, that's the domain of this. Right, and you, so could, be, you could probably get away with writing it like this. I mean, if right. the question says, what is the domain, you could just write that, and that would answer. So, but it could be bracket 0, comma, infinity, parentheses. Actually, it would be parentheses 0, comma, oh, right. no, 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 no. because it can't not, be 0. Not, exactly. not including 0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, the advantage of interpretation... So, is interval notation uh, can cover different uh, brackets. In other words, I might have negative infinity to 3 uh, combined with um, 3 to positive infinity. That would be another way of saying x could be anything but 3. Right. Right. Okay, yeah. And, it's, it's yeah, that's, two inter that's two intervals, but you can have three intervals or four intervals. And when right, you get multiple thing. intervals, interval notation usually works best. Okay. So since we're kind of running out of time, I'm going to skip to the harder questions. Okay. Are we doing half hour or an hour today? Oh, we're uh, doing an hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we hour. started at three. Okay. Yeah. So we're graphing. Graph. I have trouble with graphing. Okay. So, uh, what's the function? Oh, he didn't give us any. He just told us what they would be. Okay. What's the information he's giving you? Graphing lines. He will give us uh, two points in the coordinate plane and ask you to solve for the graph of the, uh, the equation of the line. Okay. And he wants us to write the... Um, the equation for the line. Okay, give me two points. Um, two, one, and negative three, four. What's the most important thing about a line? It's straight. Slow. 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 Oh, slow. <laughs> and not only about a line, but slope, surprisingly, is the most important thing about a line, or when you get into calculus, that's what calculus is all about, is slope. And that's why they spend so much time in algebra, too, talking about slope, uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, slope is just incredibly important to all of math. So what is the slope here? Uh, let me graph it first. When you're graphing something like this, I would not waste the time to grid it up. So all I would do is an approximation. Okay. There's no, there's no need to be precise when you're just drawing a rough graph of it. So the, the slope is uh, negative, one, negative 1 over 5. Uh, its slope is defined as rise over run. That's right. what you want to remember forever because you'll never forget that. But rise is the y-coordinate differential, and run is the x-coordinate differential. Right, okay. So and I can means... usually do these in either order. In other words, I can do y sub 1 minus y sub 2 as long as I do it the same in the denominator, as long as I do it x sub 1 minus x sub 2. 
Right. Okay. So that. So okay. So. So in this case, y, what is it? so the rise is going to be three. Okay. And the run is going to be negative five. Right. No? Correct. Negative five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the slope is minus three fifths. Okay. Okay. Now. So be, okay. You have probably been taught a couple of methods for the format for the equation of a line. The most common one is y equal mx plus b. Right. But there's another one called point slope. I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. Actually, it works better for problems like this, and I'll show you why. Um, okay. It's that. And in case you're trying to memorize point slope, notice that m would be the difference in the y's divided by the difference in the x's. Okay? Now here's why point slope is better to use. Because I have a point, and I can pick either point. I'm going to pick that one because they're both positive numbers. So y sub 1 is 1. My slope I calculated to be what is y sub? What is sub 1? That's so why, the point. Why so In other words, it's called point slope format because you have one point and you have a slope. We actually okay. have two points, but we only need one of them. Oh, okay. Okay, so we've picked this one right here. So you're just taking the y. You're taking exactly, the y. Exactly, for the moment. And then I'm going to put, instead of m, I'm going to put minus three-fifths, and then I'm going to put x minus two. Because this is my x sub 1, this is my y sub 1. Okay. Okay? And that's actually a legitimate answer. You don't have to take it any further than that. Unless the question specifically said, give it to me in slope-intercept format, then this is an acceptable answer. There is a way to do it in slope-intercept format, and let me just go through that real quick with you. It's going to kind of give you the same mean, equation. Y minus, y minus 1 equals negative 3 fifths times x minus 2. What does that actually mean? That means that's the equation of that line. Oh, okay. okay. Can you simplify that further? Sure, let's do it. It was y minus 1 equals negative 3 fifths of x minus 2. So I'll distribute that first. So I have minus 3 fifths x plus 6 fifths. And then I'll add 1 to it, which makes that 11 fifths. So there's my equation of the line in slope-intercept format. So y equals minus uh, three three, negative 3 Huh? Minus three fifths x. No, right. Minus three fifths uh, x. Plus six fifths. But plus then six. I move this one to the right side, which means I'm going to add another five fifths. So eleven fifths. So I get eleven fifths. Okay. Now, if I there's another way to do this in case you don't want to work with point slope, and that's to work with this and solve for b. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, I know the slope, and I know a point. Let's take right. that same point. So instead of y, I'm going to say 1. It's going to be equal to minus 3 fifths instead of x. I'm going to say 2. And I don't know what b is yet, but now I'm going to be able to solve for it. And notice that y intercept, right? b is the y-intercept. And when I solve for it, I get plus 11 fifths, which okay. is the y-intercept right there. Fifths plus b. So then you add 6 fifths? Correct. So it's going to be 11 fifths. B equals 11 b. fifths, yeah, which is the same formula we got when we did point slope and right. modified. Okay. And point slope has to be a lot What's that? Point slope seems a lot to be a well, lot easier. Well, it's one step easier, I think, because uh, when you use this method, you have to actually solve for b. Whereas when you use point slope, in one step, you have the answer. 
Now, right. it kind of depends. If you're if the question is, give me the answer in slope-intercept format, well, then right. I have a lot of work still to do here. But if you but if the if only the answer needs to be in slope intercept, I could do it in point slope and then transfer it. Yes, you could. Yes, you could. Um, and then I just have to find the y intercept. Right. But if they um, don't specify a format, then point slope is going to be the easiest and quickest because that right. gives you the answer in one step. You don't have to solve for any b or anything. And but, what was I going to say? Go ahead. Um, now, in terms of graphing it. It's a little harder to graph point slope. In other words, I don't know how to graph this immediately. It's point slope because you just all you need is one point and a, and the slope, correct? Exactly. That's why it's called point slope. Yes. Okay. The problem is, is that if I go to graph that, I don't really know where to begin. Whereas right. if I have it in slope intercept format, I always begin at the y intercept and then I do the slope. Okay, well, in this particular problem, since we started out by drawing both points, all we have to do is connect it with a straight line, and we have our graph. Right, okay. Although, if you want to make your graph be very accurate, then you'd want to make sure that point is 11 fifths, because that's the y-intercept. Which is 2 and a fifth. Right. So and that makes sure you well, yeah, it's close, but uh, like I said, I just approximated my drawing here. Right. Which, Mine, I'm actually on graph paper. Okay. If you're on a graph paper, then you don't want to approximate it. You want to go ahead and use the grids. Right. And if uh, yeah, this is this is exactly I I would show you, but it's like exactly two and like a, a fifth over perfect. like perfect. It's a tiny perfect. little notch over two. Yeah, as long as your two points are in the right spot and you connect them with a straight line, then you're going to go through 11 fifths. There's no way not to. Right. Okay, but as far as writing the equation of it, if he didn't specify, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, I'm going to use that. He didn't even teach that to us. Ah, so. okay. Well, never it'll be interesting that. when he gets that then. There's right. basically two formats for straight lines, and that's point slope and slope intercept. And a lot of people only work with slope intercept. I mean, they're comfortable with that. They know how to graph that. They know everything about that format. Whereas when you work with point slope format, it's a little harder to graph. I can graph it only if I distribute that and move that one over, and then I can graph it. Right. Okay, so before we have to go, uh -huh. the net, the last concept that I'm having troubles with is parabolas. Okay. I just don't understand how to find them. Okay. Parabolas are quadratics. Right. That's what a parabola looks like. Right. It can be opening up or it can be opening down somewhere. And it doesn't have to have its vertex at the origin. If I make this y equals x squared minus x minus 2, that's still a quadratic. So it's still a parabola, but it's not a parabola whose vertex is at the origin. It's a parabola that has um, intercepts of... Min of 1 and minus 2. So this parabola would look something like that. Why? Where'd you get the 1 from? 1 is in front of the x, right? The if coefficient? I factor this, I get y equals x minus 2 times x plus 1. And that is in x-intercept format. That tells me my zeros of my parabola meaning where it's going to cross the x-axis, are going to be where that equals 0, which is at plus 2. Excuse me, I drew the parabola wrong. I thought I did. I started to put the, that one there. It's this way. So it's at plus 2 and minus 1. Right. It's wherever it makes y 0. Right, because... Y becomes 0 when that's equal to 0 or when that's equal to 0. And if okay. I solve both of those equations, I get x equal 2 or x equal minus 1. How do you find the vertex, though? 
Well, that's a good question. There's multiple ways to find the vertex, and there's multiple formats for quadratics. This format that I've just written is called the x-intercept format, and it looks like this. Hey, one second, I'm just writing. And you can't really get the vertex, the entire vertex, immediately from that. You do know the line of symmetry. The line of symmetry is going to run halfway between those two intercepts. So okay. if my intercept was at minus 1 and 2, then my line of symmetry is going to come at the x-coordinate 1 half. Okay. So that's helpful on where it is on the well, x axis. yeah. It tells you what the x-coordinate of the vertex is. But if you want the y-coordinate of the vertex, I need to plug in 1 half into this equation. And then that'll tell me what y is when x is 1 half. Okay, so you use y, is that y equals a times x minus p times x minus q? Yes. Now, that's only one format, and that's actually not the most common. The most common what? format is vertex format. So wait, in that last, sorry, in that last equation you had one half as your midpoint, and so uh, you would plug that in? For x. For the x, and so it would be y equals a times one-half minus well, p. Well, no, my original equation, if you'll remember right, was this. I had factored it to get it to the other. So if I know that the x-coordinate of the vertex is one-half, which I figured out because it was halfway between my two intercepts. Right. Now, to get the y-coordinate of the vertex... I need to plug in one half into there. So I get one half squared minus one half minus two, which is one fourth minus one half minus two, which is minus two and three fourths. That's the y, and that is the y coordinate of the vertex. Oh, and so you plug that in. Right. You plug that into that bottom equation you have there? No. In other words, your question was, how do I know where the vertex is? That's where it oh. is. In other yeah. words, that parabola that I drew, this point right there is one-half, comma, minus two and three-quarters. Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, it's not really hard, but there's actually a better method if you have it in vertex format. In other okay. words, vertex format, which is by far the more common format, this is the one you're going to see and probably were taught, is that. Now, what's special about that is that H and K are the vertex. H squared plus K. No, H and, K are, H and K are the vertex. In other words, if I give you a quadratic that looks like this, I know the vertex is at 3, 5. Okay. So well, what if, if I have what it in vertex format, I instantly know the vertex. And the vertex is really the most important thing to know about a problem. Right. So that's why this is the most common, is, is that the vertex is usually what you want to know first. Well, you, how do you know second is the y-intercepts, and so that's why we have a y-intercept format also. They don't want to use h and k, so they use p and q. How do you apply that vertex, finding the vertex thing? Okay, you complete the square. You familiar with completing the square? A little bit. Okay, well, that's how you get it into vertex format. In other words, if you get it, notice the format that I originally gave it to you in was in neither. That's not in either of those formats. Right. Because that's easily factorable, I can put it into x minus 2 times x plus 1, and now I can put it into x-intercept format really easily. But I can also put it into vertex format. And the way you do it is you have to complete the square. But you'll see that we're going to get that vertex of one half comma 
11 fifths by doing it this way. Now, what I do here is I put parentheses around the X's. I move the two way off to the right. So I start like that. I haven't changed anything yet. Okay. Now, to complete the square, I take half of the coefficient of the X term and I square it. That's one half and I square it and I add it right there. Now, I can't arbitrarily just add one-fourth to the right side of this equation, but I can do it if I subtract one-fourth at the same time. Okay. Now, because I completed the square, I'm able to write this as x minus one-half squared. That's what this is, is x minus one-half squared. Combine those two numbers, you get... Didn't we get 11 fifths last time? Oh, that must have been a different problem. Yeah, that was a different problem. Um, it was a di okay, I'm trying to get 11 <laughs> fifths here, and as all I can see is 9 fourths. But, so notice now I have it in perfect vertex format. Okay. Now I know where the vertex is. It's at plus 1 half minus 9 fourths. Okay, so wait, let me write this really quick x squared minus n. This is actually standard format. Yeah, I was taught this. Vertex it's, format. It's like really this weird, is and it's hard for me to understand him. Format. You actually have three different formats for quadratics. They're all parabolas, but you So the negative 9 fourths is the y yes. intercept of the yeah, vertex. The y coordinate of the vertex. And the x is minus one-half. Not minus. It's one-half. Because notice what the standard format is. It's x minus h. So okay. if I'm looking at x minus one-half, then h it's is plus, plus one-half. Okay. And, and you don't change, and you just don't change k. Well, k is plus k. So since it's a minus nine-fourths, then k is a minus nine-fourths. Right. Okay. And you never know what kind of format they're going to give it to you in. A lot of times they'll give it to you in standard format, and then they start asking questions about it. Now, there is another way to get the x-coordinate of the vertex when it's in standard format, and you've probably been taught this, and that's minus b over 2a. Now, what is this, b and a? b is the coefficient of this. And a is the coefficient of that. So I have nothing. Minus, minus b over 2a would end up being 1 over 2. That is the x-coordinate of the vertex. So, so, if, so wait, if you have it in standard format, the very fastest way you can get the vertex is to use that. Minus b over 2a. A is... A is, a is the coefficient of the x squared term, B is the coefficient of the x term, and C is the constant term. There is no C here, but... Uh, are these the B's and A's from the quadratic formula? Go ahead. These are the B's and A's from the quadratic formula? Yes. Okay. Exactly the same. So, if you had 2x squared plus 4x minus 4, a, the minus b over 2a would be minus 4 over 2 times 2. Correct. So four, ne negative 4 over 4. Negative so four. that merely means that the x-coordinate of your vertex is minus 1. That's strictly for the x-coordinate of the vertex. In fact, I could write it like this. The x-coordinate of the vertex is equal to minus b over 2a. But that helps you so much in the... Well, the once you get the x-coordinate, figuring out the y-coordinate is pretty easy. I can just plug it in. Right. So if you don't want to go to all the trouble of completing the squares and getting it into vertex format, there is a way to figure it out without doing that, and that's to use this minus b over 2a. 
Right. And sometimes they give you this they give you this quadratic equation in a form that's not factored, right? And you have to factor they can it. They give it to you in all three formats. And they are liable to. I don't know of another format they might give it to you in, but they could give it to you in this format like I have here. Oh, they, they actually give could give it format. to you already factored. I'm talking about the standard format. Right. That would you, be this. They would give you it they would give you it already factored. They might, or not factored they might, you have they to might factor. give you this problem. They might say y equals 2 times x minus 3 times x uh, minus 4. In other words, they give it to you already in factored format. Well, that's the intercept format. So I know immediately that my intercepts are at 3 and 4, right. which okay. makes my x-coordinate of the vertex at 3 and a half. Right. Okay. Words, All right. You can, you can and then go you can from plug the intercept the format the pretty quickly to find the x coordinate, the line of symmetry. It's just halfway between p and q. Right. But so when you have y equals two times x minus three times x minus four, uh -huh. and you get the you get the x coordinate of your vertex, you can't just plug that in, right? Yes, you can actually. In other words, you can, so you yeah, plug. yeah. So I know that three and a half is the x-coordinate of the vertex. Well, now plug in 3.5 to this, and you get 2 times a half times minus a half. Well, what is that? That is 2 fourths minus 1 half. So minus 1 half would be the y-coordinate of the vertex. Okay, and that, that's that's your answer for the vertex. Right. Well, you need an X and a Y coordinate. So the vertex would be at three and a half, comma, minus a half. Okay. There's the vertex based on this formula. Right. So you really have, you know, six of one and half dozen of the other ways to solve almost all of these. Right. It's almost my teacher only problem. taught a standard format, so it's really helpful to have the rest of the format. Yes, having all three formats and knowing how to turn this format into another format is helpful. Um, realizing that I can factor that immediately and turn it into this format is helpful. So there's no real right way to go. There might right. be a way to go that uh, produces fewer mistakes for the average person. Um, myself, I'm probably a little partial to the vertex format. For one thing, I don't have any problem with completing the square. I do it so much that, you know, it's not hard for me. Whereas a lot of people, it's hard. The concept of completing the square is hard. So they don't necessarily want to go from standard format to vertex format. Right. Um, but you could. But if you don't want to do that, then you can always use this method over here. Okay. Yeah, this cleared up a lot of things. Good. Good. Um, how much more time do we have? Actually, we're out of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think my mom through. is going to schedule a half hour on Sunday. Okay. Um, and then at that period, we'll go over the... Um, I just, there's only, it's inequalities of absolute values. And I really, I understand it for the most part. I was just wondering if there's easier ways to do it. There actually is a very easy way to handle inequalities and absolute values. Uh, it looks like your mom scheduled an hour on Sunday. Do you want that to only be a half hour? Um, I'll talk to her about it. And if, if she you wants want to, it to be You can leave it at an hour. And if at the end of a half hour you want to quit or, you know, stop, that's fine. I, I don't have anything afterwards, so it's not like you're going to keep me. Right. I, the only reason I wouldn't take up the whole hour is because it's just that one concept that I, I really do partially, like, I get a lot of That one concept, I tell you what, I can take care of it right now for you. Okay. It's all about understanding what this means. It means two things. It means either X is greater than 1, or, or x, x is less than minus 1. 
In other words, you never change what's inside the absolute value. But for the or part, you have to change the sign on the number and the direction. Right. Same thing if I had something like this, x minus 3 greater than 10. What does that mean? What two things that mean, does that mean? x minus 3 is greater than 10, or x minus 3 is less than negative 10. Correct. And that should clear up all problems you've had with absolute value and inequalities. That's it? That's the answer, that's right? That's it. Well, you have to, that's not quite the answer. In other words, I then have to go vertically and solve each of these. Oh, right, right. In other words, but this means to... x is greater than 13, or x, x is, is less than minus 7. So right. you have two answers. And you're always going to have two answers when you're doing absolute values and inequalities or equalities. That part I get. Okay. The part that's I don't the get. I, exactly. That's the reason I write it horizontally with the or like that, is because I know I'm going to solve it vertically, and I'm going to right. have two things to solve, and we're used to solving vertically. So, the only thing I don't get is graphing them. We can talk about that later. That's a little harder, but okay. not that much harder. All right, so we'll talk about Just that. Just know that all graphs of absolute value functions look like that. Yeah, they're all they're completely straight. Well, they they're V's. There might right. might be V's like this, or they might be V's like that, but they're all going to have this V in them. Right, because it's a straight line. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, so we'll talk about that on Sunday. Okay. Sounds good, Max. I will. Uh, now, on Sunday, I don't call each time before a session. I'll just text you the meeting ID number. Okay. Okay. And then you should have an icon on your desktop that looks kind of like this, this flower, this orange flower. E, um, let me see. I don't, but I have the other, the download thing, so okay. I have it. You, you don't have to go back and re-download it every time is what I'm trying right, to say. Right, yeah. No, I have, you have the, the um, program on yeah. your computer now, and when you double click on that to start it, it will just ask for the meeting ID number. That's all it will ask for. Okay. Okay.